Hi, my name's Bob Grinier and I'm a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. Today I'm going to talk about the possible explanations for observed Sun, Moon and Earth alignment effects, ultra-low energy neutrino flux interactions. Now this video is in response to the previous video in this series which referred to the work of Morris Elias and Xu Wen Zhu and looked at their observed effects during three body alignments and specifically we're going to focus on uh, solar eclipses in this video. If you want to go and see that video look on our YouTube channel or there will be a link in the description to this video. Also there will be a link to the PDF presentation from which the slides you see here are derived. The five effects that were observed that I will attempt to provide a hypothesis for are changes in the motion of Foucault pendulum by Morris Elias in the 1950s, changes in the strain on a thin vertically mounted brass sheet, linear crystal growth patterns in casting lead tin alloy, the shifting of spectral lines from elements, changes in the beta decay rate detected in nuclear clocks due to location and orientation. These effects discussed in the previous video along with a lot of supplementary material is well worth a review before getting into the main part of this presentation so I encourage you to go and have a look at that first. In that presentation there was no actual explanation per se for the observed effects. In this presentation I will present some hypothesis these hypotheses are based on my understanding of Alexander Parkhamov's work in addition to seven papers that I will present in a more detailed video that will follow the publication of this one. Now this slide is based on a image that was in the Xu Wenju paper in the 1999 fall edition of 21st century science that was the basis for a large part of the previous presentation and here you see the occlusion of light from the sun by the moon in a solar eclipse. Now one form of ultra low energy neutrinos is relic neutrinos and by some accounts these are the result of the Big Bang and they're kind of like leftover energy in, in a specific form and by some accounts they are around about 2 Kelvin and some of these papers they're suggesting that their physical size can be up to a meter uh, which is quite astounding from my point of view but that they would seem to be able to form a condensate and this condensate may be superfluid and therefore Due to these properties, the moon can occlude and interact with the ultra-low energy neutrinos in interesting ways that may help us explain the observed effects by Elias and Zhu. I now think it's relevant to introduce what Alexander Parkhamov wrote to me on the 2nd of April 2019 about his discovery. In 1988, when working with three-dimensional diffraction gratings and detectors, which made it possible to obtain a spatial effect distribution and accumulate information for long periods, I discovered radiation which had a micron to millimeter wavelength and had a very high penetrating power. It was clear this radiation was not light, radio waves or ultrasound. However, like these radiation types, the wavelength is much longer than the distances between atoms in a substance, i.e. interaction occurs immediately with a large number of atoms. Substance, for such radiation, is a continuous medium in which it refracts and from which it surface reflects. If there are irregularities on the surface smaller than the wavelength, mirror reflection occurs. A concave mirror allows concentration and focusing of the radiation. Even if the reflection coefficient is very small, by using a mirror with a large surface, 
you can get a large increase in the intensity of the radiation. To understand how this works, consider a plate of clear glass. Even though it is transparent, light still reflects from it well. The first experiments with focusing mirrors were made in 1992. All this and more is described in detail in parts 2 and 3 of my book, Space, Earth, Human. Now, the interesting thing about the other papers that I looked at, many of them came after this work by Alexander Parkhamov and are still very theoretical, whereas Alexander actually just went ahead based on his understanding at the end of the 1980s and conducted experiments to verify that understanding. So here's some media taken from Wikipedia on the subject of reflection and refraction, and this is between two mediums, water and air, and you've got the interface between the two mediums marked between brown and sort of transparent. And you've got some refraction going on there. If you're at a particular angle, uh, it will not penetrate into the air, and you've got a uh, sort of reflection, uh, total internal reflection there in the right-hand side. Also up on the top right-hand corner, you have some production of diffuse light where you've got light coming in and it's bouncing between crystal grain boundaries and these are sort of different properties that you can think about when considering how this form of radiation that has a very large wavelength could interact with substance. Now here is diffraction and whether or not this is relevant I'm just going to throw this in here also and on the left hand side there is an opaque object that's uh, causing some diffraction pattern and on the right hand side in the very far right you can see a similar kind of diffraction pattern but coming from a penny. Now of course the wavelength of light much smaller, the penny is much smaller, but if you can imagine in your head that the moon is the penny and the light is much longer wavelengths, could it be possible to observe some similar type of diffraction patterns? Okay, so in this diagram we have the moon in grey with the M on it and the earth in green on the right hand side the neutrino flux coming in from the left, some of it's being reflected. This would lead to some occlusion and effectively a lack of flux of uh, ultra low energy neutrinos in the kind of shadow of the eclipse. Similar in a way to actual light being shadowed. Now the blue squiggles that I've got on the circumference section of the Earth, uh, I'm suggesting that they may be sort of diffraction patterns where you have uh, higher and lower concentrations of densities of ultra-low energy neutrinos. And my kind of rotated diagram on the right, um, if you can imagine this is a superfluid and the gravity of the Earth and the alignment between the the Earth and the Sun is causing a, a flux to stream onto the Moon. Perhaps there's some sort of diffusion round or like if you can imagine water flooding over a ball and then raining down on the Earth. That's kind of what I'm trying to suggest there. Now this isn't to say that there isn't a flux of ultra-low energy neutrinos coming from other angles and impinging upon the Earth, but just that there is some interaction derived variation in the densities of ultra-low energy neutrinos due to the Moon eclipsing the Sun. So if you think about this, you could have some gradients between the diffraction areas if they are possible, or you could have gradients because of diffusion of the material, or there could be a steep gradient of neutrino density between the shadowed area and the area that is effectively, in inverted commas, illuminated by the neutrino flux. 
So the images on this slide were extracted from a GIF that was on NASA's website looking at the work of Morris Elias and the date was added by I think an artist there. Anyhow this shows the progress of the eclipse and its effect on the Foucault pendulum. Now there has been speculation even as early as the 1950s and possibly before but uh, also recently that relic neutrinos or ultra low energy neutrinos are somehow related to gravity and so I hypothesize that the reason for the observation of Maris Elias was that there was a intense gradient between the occluded area and the non-occluded area due to the moon's reflection, refraction and other potential interactions of ultra-low energy neutrino flux and this gradient caused a sideways pressure on the pendulum causing it to change its motion. Perhaps even there could be a neutrino wind, a sort of diffusion from an area of high neutrino density to an area of low neutrino density and this potentially could cause the pressure uh, that caused the deflection of the Foucault pendulum. Now I would offer a similar hypothesis for the strain variation implying a sideways movement in the brass sheet in the first of the four experiments conducted by the Chinese team led by Zhu. Additionally there was some oscillation and potentially I could suggest that this could be due to diffraction resulting in oscillating densities of ultra low energy neutrinos. I'm suggesting for the second experiment where they saw linear crystal growth patterns in the casting of lead and tin alloy this could be due to diffraction patterns uh, or interaction of diffraction patterns. Apparently due to one of the papers I was looking at it is possible that a different density of ultra low energy neutrinos could result in changing the way that electromagnetic waves travel through them and potentially this could account for the third observation of the Chinese research team led by Zhu that of the changing in spectral lines from various elements. Now Zhu's study of nuclear clocks both 137 cesium and 87 rubidium showed that there were changes depending on location or orientation. I'm suggesting this again could be due to diffraction patterns or ultra low NG neutrino gradients. Of course Zhu didn't have an explanation for these observations just that they happened during three body alignments. So that concludes my suggestions for how fluxes of ultra low energy neutrinos could have resulted in the observed anomalies during three body alignments. Now just to close out the video I have a picture here of Alexander Parkamov's ultra low energy neutrino telescope or detector. Uh, it looks a little bit like your satellite dish that you might have on the side of your house to pick up your television. But as was discussed earlier, he established that this type of radiation in the micron to millimeter range could be reflected. And even if it's not a perfect reflection, you do increase or massively increase the intensity on a target. Uh, and the targets he are looked at were strontium-90 and uh, cobalt-60 and uh, cesium-137. And in the long tube to the left upper part of the picture, that is where you have your uh, tube, your Geiger-Muller tube. And he's looking at high energy betas. You need to look at the high energy output and this gives you much better discrimination over the course of the observation period. 
And a lot of people have suggested over many decades to use uh, Invis beta processes as a means to look for ultra-low NG neutrinos, but they didn't really consider that they could be lensed in this way or focused in this way. And they were considering like very large volumes of, say, tritium and uh, seeing just a few detections per year. I absolutely love this piece of apparatus. It's got chair legs, it's got pieces of random wood that was available to him, uh, food tins. And you have to bear in mind that this was built in around about 1992, as I said earlier. It's uh, getting on for three decades old now. Uh, he says he hasn't used it in uh, about seven years. But this is post end of the uh, Cold War and scientists lost their labs and their incomes uh, and it just shows the ingenuity uh, of what can be done uh, with just understanding a process and going in head, head and building an experiment to do a job. Doesn't matter what it looks like, just that it can do the job. And this is one thing I really, really love about Alexander Parkamov and actually to be honest a lot of garage researchers just do they just do the experiment to gain some understanding and go on and do another experiment I would encourage those of you that haven't subscribed to the channel to do so that is about 70% of the people that view the channel currently and if you like the work that's being discussed here please consider supporting the Kickstarter for the translation of Alexander Parkamov's book, Space, Earth, Human. Look out for the next presentation that will discuss the papers that I used as a basis for coming to the hypothesis presented in this video. Thank you for your time.